So good afternoon. <coughs> Thanks, Dr. Shanmugam Velu, co-chair, Dr. Venkata Krishnan, friends. <coughs> I think we are in an era wherein we could offer our diabetic patients much more than what we have been doing by way of <coughs> multifactorial intervention. So I always believe that it's been a boon to practice diabetology at this juncture. So in the next 20 minutes, I think the time has to be reset. Dr. Velu, we discussed. So Krishna will finish in 15 minutes. I'll take that extra five minutes. So okay. <laughs> thank you so much. So I had, I thought it is not for the molecule alone, for the relevant science, which I thought I'll share with you, <coughs> I found it quite interesting. So this is a talk about a molecule, a new molecule, which has an impact on the natural course of chronic kidney disease in a diabetic. And to do this presentation, I have been contracted by Bayer to share some data on the relevant science and about the trials and finally about the guidelines where you can position. Let us start our discussion with <coughs> a case. 58 year old <coughs> Suresh, diabetic of 8 years duration, presumably because of a lack of poor control of the coma, which is not addressed pro properly. He has had a CKD six years after the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. Now, present HbA1c is 7.7, .7, BP is given there. Look at the EGFR, 65, CKD2, threatening to go on to CKD3A, less than 60. So giving a window of uh, opportunity for the clinician to interfere. And urine albumin creatinine ratio is 150 A2. So we can categorize this patient as CKD A2, G2, G2 probably may become a G3A. And of course, other things are given, history of CVD, etc., etc., which has been given. You can go through the slide. So how do you treat a patient like this, Suresh? A slide on epidemiology. We know about the magnitude of the problem of diabetes, but what is relevant for today's discussion is close to about 35 to 40 percent of our diabetics have CKD. Previously, we used to call it as diabetic kidney disease. Now, yes, the diabetic kidney disease does encompass a good proportion of patients with nephropathy. And even in diabetic nephropathy, you have got various presentations with or without albuminuria. And you have presentation with a course, which is probably un inexplicable in the sense that it is normal, normal pattern of decline in the EGFR. Some, of, some people do have a faster decline in the EGFR and they do not have any significant proteinuria. And also, nothing prevents a diabetic patient to have a non-diabetic renal disease. For example, recurrent pyelonephritis, and maybe other, other diseases which a diabetic, non-diabetic can have. So it's always better because nowadays the strategy is to target the CKD. So I think the terminology is DM with CKD. Why are we talking so much about CKD? I think all of us are aware of this. These figures are really alarming in the sense that it should be a warning signal to the clinicians that a hardcore endpoint mortality is unfavorably altered if there is a co-presentation of type 2 DM and CKD compared to the individual uh, risk with diabetes and CKD per se. So if you look at the, this is the conventional model of the progression of diabetic kidney disease. So wherein you start with some amount of albumin, go on to the A2 stage and the A3, and the GFR progressively comes down. And by definition, which we'll see subsequently, <coughs> an estimated eGFR of less than 60, CKD3A, beyond three months, and urine albumin excretion more than 30 milligram per gram of creatinine can be taken as indices. This is the uniformly accepted uh, cutoff levels for categorizing patients. And if you look at the bottom line, yes, you do have good number of patients who have CKD3A without prior 
I will be mini urea. Lot of reasons may be there. Number one is we always talk about diabetic kidney disease in the context of a functional dysfunction in the glomerular at the, tissue, at the level of the glomerular tissue. Intraglomerular hypertension, efferent arteriolar constriction because the efferent arteriole is exquisitely sensitive to the pressage and you have RAS blockers to address that and defective afferent arterial modulation thanks to the hyperexpression of the SGLT transporters MRA, uh, messenger RNA. So, and you have the basement membrane thickening and you have loss of heparin sulfate which always ripples and loss of that pulls the albumin into the urinary space. What I am trying to say is, in diabetic nephropathy, it is not an intrinsic glomerular disease. It is a functional glomerular disease with some amount of uh, histopathological findings like basement membrane thickening. Later on, you have the podocytes, the epithelial food process, they fuse. At that stage, you have macro proteinuria, large molecules get thrown. This is happening at one side. Concomitantly, there is, in between the glomeri, you have the mesangial expansion. The mesangium is a connective tissue, so which chokes the glomeri. So that is responsible for the downward uh, decline in the EGFR as the diabetic kidney disease progresses. So varying levels of albuminuria, initially due to the functional abnormality, Subsequently, structural abnormalities do play a role, and the mesangial expansion predominantly <coughs> chokes the glomeruli so that the functioning EG, uh, the glomeruli comes down. And this is being compensated by the surviving nephrons, which do the hyperfunction. Yet another aspect of the diabetic pathophysiology, nephropathy, is the tubular component. In fact, I remember when we were MD students, Short notes on diabetic uh, Armani Epstein lesion, Kimmel seal. So, Armani Epstein lesion is glycogen vacuoles in the tubules. That's all. The functional significance of this we do not know. Whereas, now we know that tubulo interstitial damage contributes a lot. That is probably because of the infection. That is because of the upregulation of the mineralocortical receptor in the scenario of diabetes. Now, you may turn around and ask, why should the mineralocortical receptor upregulate in a diabetic? We do not know. My speculative explanation is <coughs> the body senses the kidney tissue has got some pathology, try to eliminate. And what does the body do to eliminate something? Initiate inflammation. I think that the basic process of the, uh, the, the organism to throw off something which is a detriment, but unfortunately, such sort of a panic reaction by the body, we have seen in the messenger RNA hyperexpression for the SGLT2 uh, transporters. So likewise, there is a mineralocortical receptor, and I mean, uh, hyperexpression, which gives scope for intervention because now we realize that the component with respect to the tubular interstitial fibrosis mediated by the inflammation can be targeted much more effectively. <coughs> Existing molecules probably do have a role with respect to the inflammation, but a dedicated targeting of these receptors might have an additional benefit. I think that is the philosophy behind this. So this is the clinical diagnosis of CKD, which I have already told you, UACR as well as the GFR, more than three months. <coughs> so again, I think uh, one the favorite subjects for all of us interested in the theory and practice of diabetes is, I think the kidney. Thanks to the SGL2 inhibitors, we have learned a lot of renal physiology. I think gives an opportunity. So what is its efferent arteriole? What is afferent arteriole modulation? Intraglomerular hypertension, we know that. Then we also realized how probably certain amount of substrate facilitation by the SGLT2 can influence the functional status of the renal tissue. I mean, a lot of things we have, some of them may be relevant, some of them proven, some of them are hypothesis generating, some of them just uh, incidental findings. But so one aspect of the renal pathophysiology, which probably has not been addressed properly, is the inflammation fibrosis. Because hemodynamics, we have, as you will see in the next slide, we have the molecules like your ACE inhibitors and ARBs and other antihypertensive drugs. The efferent arteriole preferentially 
target, I mean, have an effect, uh, the effect is by the RAS blockers. Why the efferent arteriole undergoes constriction? Because it lacks the vasodilative prostaglandins with afferent arteriole has. So you have the RAS blockers, you have the SGLT2 to act on the afferent arteriole, and uh, other advantages of these two molecules are there. You add on top other molecules for the target BP to be arrived. But what are we doing for the inflammation? So the inflammation is one aspect. Probably you can say some of these drugs do have an anti-inflammatory effect as well. Even for the SGLT2 inhibitors, it has been said. Maybe for the GLP receptor agonists, yes. But dedicated targeting the inflammatory pathways in the context of the kidney disease, I think that has been the purpose of today's presentation, highlighting the performance of this molecule. So these are some of the trials. You give a rust blocker, in this case I've taken the renal study, losartan versus placebo, there is a reduction with respect to some of the hardcore renal endpoints. On top of it, you add the SGLT2 inhibitors, it's a class effect, whether it is CANA, DAPA, or EMPA, you have. But the message is, targeting the hemodynamics and other partially understood or even un ill understood mechanisms a combination of RAS blockers and SGLT2 inhibitors do address and have a favorable effect on hardcore renal endpoints, but there is a residual renal risk. Like we talk, talk about the residual cardiovascular risk, there is a residual renal risk. <coughs> Our purpose of this discussion is whether by addressing the inflammation, by modulating the mineral receptor antagonism is going to address this component of the residual risk in a significant manner. I think that will be the anticipation of the clinicians. As I told you, <coughs> mineral receptor over activates, over activated in the presence of diabetes mellitus and these are expressed in many tissues including the cardiovascular as well as the renal tissue and then you see it. How do they affect? They have got various effects, the mineralocortical receptors, but for the discussion today, what is relevant is they initiate, perpetuate, and worsen the inflammatory pathways. And the ultimate end of inflammation is fibrosis. So you can just imagine if such a component is going to be operative in the context of the kidney disease, then it is worth targeting it from the concept point of view. Phenerenone targets, now we'll come to the molecule. MR overactivation, which may contribute to kidney. Now, it always makes an interesting comparison between what are the molecules that are available on board. Spy that is, you have the spironolactone, aprinolone, as well as the new molecule. The difference between these two is, phenerenone is non-steroidal, so, Steroid effect related side effects like gynecomasia are not there, number one. Number two, potency for the MR is as good as spironolactone, as you will see here. And it is selective for the MR, obviously, because it is non-steroidal. And being a huge molecule, and the duration of action is just two to three hours. So this makes it should down the line, because even in the trial, hyperkalemia has been observed as a finding. Hyperkalemia has been observed as a finding. Because of the short half-life of this individual, stopping the molecule gives you relief which could be sustained or even temporary that you have to do by trial, I mean, estimating the serum potassium about which we'll discuss. So the profile of this molecule is in such a way, it addresses one of the recently recognized pathophysiological components of the diabetic kidney disease, that is overexpression of the mineral corticoid receptors, number one. And in doing it, it performs as effectively as spironolactone, but devoid of the side effects because of its non-steroidal nature and the short half-life should be assuring the clinicians, yes, whenever you address, antagonize the mineral receptor, then certainly the hyperkalemia is always a problem, but how do the clinicians address this? More importantly, just because the molecule is available, are you going to use it? Or as it been proved to be really beneficial in 
dedicated renal outcome and cardiovascular trials. We will see in the next 10 minutes. You have the time Bill? of the 20. And two more minutes extra I have stolen from. So, so far, I think I have summarized it already. Chairperson will not allow me more than six minutes. <coughs> so, we will go through the phase three trial of this molecule. There are two trials. One is the Fidelio CKG, that is the Figaro. And as you will see here, in the first one, hardcore renal endpoints are the primary endpoints, and the cardiovascular were secondary endpoints, and vice versa in the Figaro DKD. I'll just run through because it's there available in the literature. You can go through that. What happened? It's not moving. Slide is not moving. I'm just using the laptop and both. Ah, okay, okay. Right. So what they did was, you have two trials, two great trials about this molecule, predefined. Uh, they have decided to combine the data of these two and then give some message to the clinician so that the fidelity is a pre-specified pooled analysis of fidelio DKD and. Figaro DKD, one with hardcore renal endpoints, the other with hardcore cardiovascular endpoints. If you look at the spectrum of the patients covered in these two trials here, so you have patients <coughs> with varying levels of albuminuria, A2 to A3, and also more importantly, you have right from CKD G1, G2, G3A, 3B, as well as 4. So, a wide range of CKD subjects with a EGFR range of around 25 to 90 has been studied with good amount of urine albumin creatinine ratio. Inclusion and the exclusion criteria are there. Only thing the serum uh, potassium should be less than 5 or 4.8. Points are duration of diabetes is high. Number two, because the increased duration, good number of subjects are on insulin. And the messages. 88% of the subjects in the Fidelio had an EGFR of CKD3, A, B, or 4. 88%. And likewise, if you look at the urine albumin creatinine ratio, 88% have stage A3 of albumin excretion. And the Figaro is given the details, the basic history. And uh, all of them are on maximal tolerated dose of RAS blockers. On top of it, the other molecules have been there. <coughs> so these are the results. This molecule on top of standard of care in a highly vulnerable population has resulted in a 18% reduction in CKD progression, 14% in CV mortality and morbidity. And if you look at the Figaro, yes, the cardiovascular endpoints were significant, whereas the CKD progression was numerically better, not statistically significant. That is quite understandable because the recruitment EGFR was quite high in the Figaro decade. Fidelity is a pre-specified analysis. 40% of the patients had albuminuric CKD with preserved kidney function. That is EGFR more than 60. That's quite an interesting point. So if you look at the pooled analysis, there is a 14% reduction with respect to the cardiovascular endpoints because the numbers are more than 13,000. The follow-up is more than three to three and a half years. I think the message is loud and clear. And of course, some of the exploratory endpoints have been significant here, hospitalization for heart failure. These are exploratory. And you have the renal endpoints. And in the secondary analysis, in the pooled analysis, they looked at a 57, more than 50% reduction in the estimated EGFR. This is amazing. 54, because I think doubling of serum creatinine comes to about 54% reduction. This is more than that, 57%. Now, are there any subgroups? This is exploratory. Are there any subgroups with different levels of EGFR who are preferentially benefited or albumin excretion, the answer is no. Look at the P4 interaction, they are beneficial. And also with respect to both the cardiovascular as well as the renal outcome. And look at the reduction in UACR. It occurs as early as three to four months and sustained to during the entire study. And uh, all cause mortality and uh, which was pre-specified, that is on treatment, CV mortality, <coughs> look at it. It has been favorably impacted. and. The benefits were consistent irrespective of it. See, to be very frank with you, I think when this trial started, very few people were exposed to SGLT2, probably less than 5%. But even then, 
if you look at it, there is a balance between the placebo and the active uh, comparator arm. There is no preferential benefit or lack of benefit with prior SGLT2 and uh, the, all the endpoints you can see here, heart failure, EGFR, etc., etc. <coughs> is it influenced by the degree of glycemic control? The answer is no, as you will see here, both for the CV as well as the cardiovascular outcome. Is it influenced by anything else? For example, prior cardiovascular outcome as well as the kidney outcome with a previous history of such cardiovascular disease? The answer is no. You always have safety profile, yes. Obviously, you don't expect the hormone-like behavior of this molecule, so there is no gynecomasia or the breast hyperplasia. And uh, related to study drug, etc., you have a fringe benefit in the form of the BP reduction. Hyperkalemia leading to reduction, I mean withdrawal, was probably 1% more in the phenomenon. If 46 percent, 46 patients can be treated for three years to prevent one hardcore cardiovascular and renal endpoint, if that is going to be associated with just 1% of withdrawal, and also this difference was only about 0.2 millimoles, and as I told you, because of the short half-life, yes, in the algorithm, we'll see how we go about it. So our patient is a good candidate because he falls in the category of A2 and CKD2, threatening to go to CKD3A, and probably he is one of the candidates for consideration of this molecule if the clinician feels that is going to give him a real benefit. And that's why you have the indications by the approval in India as well as the US FDA. So the pillars of good treatment in diabetes is there. Here you have the pillars of the DKD, RF blockers, SGLT2. Now you have the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism in the form of phenylalanine. And all the guidelines have recognized the contribution made by these data so that it has a message to the clinicians to consider incorporating this molecule. This is the flow chart. If the EGFR is good, start with 20, otherwise 10. Monitor the serum potassium every month, first month, and then every four months. At any stage, if the serum potassium is going to exceed 5.5, withdraw and restart at a lower dose after a month of doing the potassium. On the other hand, if the patient holds on, because there are other causes for the potassium also, you are dealing with patients with CKD, yes, it can worsen an already abnormal parameter which, which we are witnessing in the context of the CKD, but you need to be careful with respect to this. Maintain if it is going to be less than 5.5. 5 Fs initiate when the potassium is less than 5. Abandon when it is more than 5.5. And more than 25, you have the data for recruitment and USC are more than 30. You have the benefits in amelioration or a favorable impact on end-stage kidney disease by 20% and also by heart failure or hospitalization by 20%. So thank you so much. Uh,